welcome. This is the Kestrel Country Podcast, where we discuss the people, places, and events all around Kestrel Country. Hey guys, welcome to another edition of the Kestrel Country Podcast. We are coming to you from uh, cozy self-isolation here in North Idaho. Uh, Coming to you from our living room, I'm your host, Mike Church, and joined once again by my lovely wife and co-host, Catherine. Hello, hello. And um, yeah, we're sitting here in our living room, enjoying the beautiful sunshine dining room. It's an open concept. We We do this every time. (laughs) It's... uh, but it's a beautiful sunny day um, here, beginning of April, um, enjoying living in this place. You know, really grateful to be here on the Palouse um, during this time. It's a it's a crazy time for some, a scary time um, with uh, coronavirus and everything. But just grateful to be, if you're going to be in self-isolation to, to or quarantine, to be here in this beautiful area. So. That's for sure. Definitely makes you appreciate property. Yeah. So today... Um, we had Dr. Shane Needham on our podcast. From Alturas Analytics. Yeah, Shane is a scientist, a bodybuilder, um, a motivational speaker, Coach. Um, podcast host now. Um, he's doing all kinds of things, and, and he talks about not wanting to be placed in a box. He's certainly done a good job um, with that and has built a business here on the Palouse and, and um, has been involved in a lot of things, including mostly the pharmaceutical world. Um, so really interesting to hear about his story, his love of small town America and hard work. Yeah, absolutely. So without further ado, let's uh, get right into our call here with uh, Shane Needham. Well, Dr. Shane Needham, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, We really appreciate you taking the time. And it is funny, we've been, you know, our podcast is is all about the local area, right? And so it's been been funny to have to do that over the phone because we're all in the same town with most of the people we talk to. But thus, you know, this is the world we're living in right now. And what a great opportunity too, right? I mean, it's like, uh, imagine years ago, we couldn't do this. So, oh, yeah. you know, what, what, where there are challenges, there are opportunities. And so it's great that you guys are taking, you know, full advantage of that. So really, really good job. Oh, thanks. Well, you too. I've seen a lot of what you're doing. And I think, you know, again, our, our podcasts, our listeners, mostly about kind of talking about the people, places, and events all around this area and uh, one of the things that we like to do is talk to folks who are involved in the community, business owners, business leaders, folks who are, you know, doing things here. And um, so I wanted mm-hmm. to have you on the line and, and just talk a little bit. Maybe you can start by giving us your background, who you are, you know, what brought you here? What have you kind of done mm-hmm. in your professional life? And, um, you know, what are you up to these days? Yeah, absolutely. And so, my professional life is sure an important part of my life, but you know, I don't look at that as the most important. And then I, I am first a disciple. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ and he's my savior and, and God. And second of all, I'm a father. I'm a father of four wonderful children who happen to be adults in, in college at this point. I'm getting to, well, I was supposed to graduate in May, but I guess they won't be walking, but they'll be graduating. And so, and I have two um, sons, uh, younger sons as well that are, that are in middle school actually. And so that's really, but I've done so many other things. And so I've never wanted to be identified as one thing. And I, I like that people know I'm a scientist. People know I'm owner of Alturas Analytics. I, I, I was started out as the, the co-founder and the chief scientist there. And, um, and so it's, it's, it's been just a great journey, but I'm also, um, uh, in bodybuilding and in, uh, doing powerlifting. Now I'm a podcaster. I've been a, I've been a coach of wrestling and supported that, that community. And, and so, so many other things. And, and what happened, um, actually, Mike and Catherine, is it, I guess I've become a mentor. And that I didn't realize that was never a goal of mine, but it's been such an important process for me and for others. And it's just been really, really great connecting with people. And I had an opportunity to do a TED Talk last year as well. And 
yeah. and some motivational speaking. And, and now I have a, a, a podcast. It's really, really cool just to talk about it. It's called Secrets of Success. And the theme is never be outworked. And we'll probably get into that. But that's one thing I like about this community and this area. And growing up in rural America, like I did, I grew up about two hours away from here um, uh, in the in the Columbia Basin, actually. Okay. And so, hmm. and it was, you know, in the, it, it, it's my story. I mean, you know, that's what it was. I grew up in a small, small town, Colosello, Washington. And so that's about two hours away from Washington State University. I always knew I wanted to go to college. I always knew I wanted to be a scientist and probably an analytical chemist of somebody that's testing stuff. And that's what I am. And so I fulfilled that dream. I, I my, got my bachelor's degree from Washington State University a long time ago. That's what I'll say. And then um, I had some opportunities to stay local and regional. And and I knew, and my professors were so good at Washington State University. They're like, Shane, you really need to get a PhD. You really need to get a doctorate in chemistry. You're really good. You like science. You're passionate about it. So you need to do that. Well, I, I dead broke at the time, like most undergrads. And so... I, I didn't want to do it the traditional way. I didn't really want to go to graduate school and, and be a typical graduate student. So um, Washington State was very, very good to me. I, 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 I got, I'll just be honest, I got okay grades. I wasn't the smartest person in the room, and I'm still not. Um, I had to work twice as hard as everybody else, just like I did in high school. Things don't really come natural to me, so I've had to work for it, and that's really been one of my successes. And I, I, you know, I worked on farms growing up, and my dad still a hard worker. My dad is 71 years old and works 60 hours a week for a paycheck. Oh, wow. And he doesn't have to. He does not have to. Mm-hmm. He could he, Financially, he could easily retire. So he's actually forced to take his retirement and he's still working. So he's like double dipping and I'm so proud of him. And he, he, he could, he outworks me. I couldn't last as long as he could. <laughs> <laughs> and he, that's, it's amazing. Is he in Othello still then? He's actually in Moses Lake, so okay. that's kind of like yeah. a you know mm-hmm. a, a border town. And my brother's there as well. Okay. And my brother owns a owns a pharmacy. Him and his wife are both pharmacists. And, mm. and so um, anyway, come from a just a, my dad always taught us how to work and, and taught us the value of money and the value of hard work. And so and he still and he still um, lives that lifestyle. So graduated from Washington State University, and I had some opportunities locally. And um, but I just knew that I wanted more education because I wanted that PhD. It's just in science, it's it's kind of necessary and I'm not one to think that the smartest people have letters behind their names. I'm just not. And I don't think those are the successful people necessarily, but sometimes it just, I, a boss of mine once said this, once you have those letters behind your name, you're assumed you're good. And that's probably true. Um, and so, so I wanted to go work for a company where they would pay for my education, my PhD, but at the same time, I could be getting experience and working and put up a 401k, build up retirement, get experience and so on and so forth. So I chose to move 3,000 miles away. And I was in, I chose to move to Connecticut and um, work for the largest pharmaceutical company called Pfizer. They're still the largest, I believe, by revenue. And it was a, a great experience. And they, I was able to, during the day, work my 40 or 50 hours a week. And then at nights and on the weekends, I would work on my PhD. Wow. And so it was very difficult, very difficult. Yeah. Cool. I did it in six, six years. Wow. Yeah. What, what was that was, like? The, the, it was there much culture shock for you? You know, I can't imagine going from, you know, a fellow from, you know, rural farming Northwest to Connecticut to the East coast. Was that, how, how was that transition? Yeah. Let me tell you about a little bit of the culture shock. So absolutely. I want to tell you about two kind of professional culture shock and also, which, which made me know to myself, I know that I've got to get a PhD. Let me tell you about that. And then also just the culture shock of the East Coast versus the West Coast. So moved to the East Coast and every time I would shake somebody's hand, they would say, oh, Shane Needham, you must be Irish, right? I'm like, I don't know. You're like, <laughs> They're like, you don't, you don't know what you are? I said, no, actually, actually, this would really freak them out because this is not uncommon out West. I'd say, all I really know is that I have Cherokee Indian in me. And they're like, what? You're kidding me. Are you seriously? You're Indian? I'm like, I, a little bit. Everybody out West kind of is probably. I mean, that's how we migrated um, East. But everybody was so concerned about who your father's father was and where your heritage was. And they had lived there for generations and in Boston or 
in Connecticut, or it was there's just this, and it was just the strangest thing. And and obviously the East Coast, I would describe it as. By the way, there are beautiful people there. In, in in the years that we lived there, we really didn't make very many close friends. The people are just, um, even though the population is is much bigger, maybe that's why it happens. They're just, we would call them out west, I guess, distant and cold. Mm-hmm. I don't think that they mean to be that way. But you, you, when you go to the grocery store, the person checking you out will not say hi, how are you? They will not even tell you the price of all your goods. They will just wait there. It's the strangest thing. And and you're like, you're waiting for them to say, yeah, it'd be $22 and 14 cents. Nothing. So it's a huge culture shock. So the P and it, it's a little bit more of a rat race. So it's, you know, um, and they, and it, so we finally, the friends that we did make, they would come out West and they're like, everybody is so nice here. We're like, <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it, it, you know, however, the educational opportunities there were incredible. I mean, I could have gone to, it just in, within an hour driving distance, I could have gone to UConn, University of Connecticut. I could have gone to Yale. I could have gone to Brown. Or I could have gone to University of Rhode Island. And I went to University of Rhode Island because my advisor that was going to be, the person that's going to be my advisor was just well known in the industry and amazingly understanding with my juggling of the situation. And she just loved it. We published together and amazing lady, just an amazing lady. She's passed on. Um, God rest her soul, but she was just an amazing lady that really supported me the whole time. And then I had uh, supervisors that supported me as well, and my and and um, family as as well. But that was like the culture shock of oh my gosh, we're out west. Did I make a mistake? I moved me and my wife at the time all the way across the country, and it's like oh my gosh, did I make a mistake? You know, because like we just weren't used to it. Mm-hmm. We just were not used to that culture. And then. That was like within a week, a week of, of being there, right? Then I go to my first day at work. And I remember I don't have a PhD. And I ask people on the interview, you know, I interviewed with about eight different people. Do I, do I need a PhD here? You know, what, what's the ceiling like if I don't have a PhD? And, you know, when you're interviewing, I'm not saying that people are lying. <laughs> but they're going to give you the best case scenarios all the time. And so they're saying, no, you don't need a PhD. It's all up to you or whatever. So I, 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 my first day there, I get my new security card and then I walk up to my, to my, um, department and they were showing me where I was going to sit and I'm looking around and it's like, there's nobody in the department. There's, there should be like a hundred people and all these offices are empty and there's, but I see a few of the people that I'd met and gone to dinner and lunch with. And those were people that were non PhDs. I'm like, so I asked them like, what's going on? Where is everybody? And they said, Oh, they're at a staff meeting. I said, what do you, we don't get to go to staff meetings. Oh no, all of the PhDs go. Oh. I'm like, oh really? Yeah. So it gets worse. Listen to this. I go to order a chair. They say, oh, you need to order a chair. Just look in this catalog and order a chair. So I said, okay, I want this one. And they say, oh no, that one has arms on it. Only people with PhDs can have arms on a chair. <laughs> no way. I'm not. I'm not kidding you. And so it, this gets deeper and deeper. So I'm looking at. They say, oh, and sign the, here. Sign this thing and. Um, give us your extension number and we'll make a phone list for everybody and we circulate around the department when anybody new starts. Okay. So I look at the phone list when it comes back. I'm like, wait, how come this person has a middle initial in their, phone, in their name but I don't have my middle initial? They said, well, you don't have a PhD. Only PhDs have middle initials on, their, in their, on the phone list. <laughs> I was like, in, and I knew right then I have to get a PhD. It was like the the attitude, if you can't beat them, join them. Mm. And, it, it, and it, I, I knew I wasn't going to be the smartest person, but I, I just had to do it. I, I had to do it to get those credentials. And, and so um, that's what I did. So at night and on the weekends, I would do all my graduate work and travel to the University of Rhode Island to take classes. I did a lot of my research at, at actual um, work as well. And so it was a great collaboration between work and, and university. And, and then... And, um, you know, during the day I would do my, do my job, so to speak at Pfizer. And so, you know, I tell people this and it's like, you, you know, everybody has a story. And I, that's what I love about rural small town America is that people know how to work. And I see it all the time when I'm in Moscow, I see it all the time when I'm in farm communities. Now, am I afraid that that's changing? I am. Mm. I'm afraid that there tends to be an entitlement generation that we're raising. And that, that worries me. It worries me for my kids. And so, but I tell people this, I did not have a hobby 
I would always lift weights. And I, I, I don't even consider weightlifting a hobby. Am I thankful that God keeps me healthy enough that I could do it? So yes, but it's not a hobby of mine. It's just, it's something that I got to do, right? But hiking, fishing, hunting, any of that things, I did not have any of that until I was about 37 or 38 years old. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, cause then I can, and so I had an opportunity to start the business and with a couple of co-founders in, in Moscow in the year 2000. I had offers to be a scientist at many different pharmaceutical companies all around the nation, um, Seattle, Colorado, New Jersey, and I chose to be an entrepreneur. And so I was a lead scientist at Alters and Lates that started with all the contacts and did everything at that point. I mean, sales, marketing, wrote the SOPs, did the experiments, um, talked to clients, uh, logged in, sampled everything wore a whole bunch of different hats. And now, you know, I've had different people take over all those roles as, we, as we, we've expanded. And But Moscow, why Moscow? And I know mm-hmm. that's something that you've talked about, Mike. As you guys know, Moscow is a great small-town community, yet it's still very well-connected. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, we have University of Idaho, Washington State University, so we're still well-connected. And, and I'm connected with both those universities. I'm an alum at WSU, where I do a lot of stuff with University of Idaho as well. And so it's connected and you, you have a lot of, I like to call them kids. I know I shouldn't, but that's basically who they are to me. But you have a lot of students who graduate from University of, uh, University of Idaho or Washington State University. And they've, they've grown up in small town America, maybe in Idaho somewhere, maybe in Eastern Washington. And they're a scientist, you know, let's say biology or chemistry or, and as we all know, there's not a lot of opportunities outside big cities for those types of background and experience and degrees. And so we give them that opportunity and if they, and we train them for skill. So if we, if they have the right attitude, everybody can be trained. Mm-hmm. And so that we, we just love this community. And so we're all, you know, everything's via email now and everything's via, we're, we can get FedExes on Saturdays now. And that's, that's, that's huge for us because we get samples in and out all week long. And so Moscow just been a great opportunity for not only for us as an employer, but for, you know, also employees for our team members to, you know, make a living and make a good one and raise a family here. I mean, you know, we, we, we have clients in Boston and Seattle and they just, when they come and visit us, they'll visit our, our lab and they'll inspect us and stuff. And they'll say, you know, they'll hear about our quality of life and that, you know, our team members will, you know, leave work at 3 p.m. to go watch a soccer game or take a kid to a dental appointment, and then they'll be back by 4 to do some more work, and that's that's unheard of in big cities. Mm. Right. You just can't either 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 you miss all that stuff or you just don't do it. Right. And so, you know, I'm sure you guys have heard these similar stories. It's just, it is a great place to have a family, and the quality of life is something that I'm just so grateful for so great before so and it's great to do business in idaho too idaho is very business friendly we've been very happy with you know with with um, how idaho has done you know how they how they treat businesses and how they want to want to grow businesses and so it's just it's really like a perfect storm for us so it's just a great place to have a a, a, a business yeah how did when you first kind of got started um did you have a lot of challenges to overcome you know it, it was it kind of having to explain to, to people, to your customers, you know, why you're here, um, you know, is yeah. are all of your competitors in those big cities and was that much of a challenge or is that something that, you know, just kind of, um, was not much of a surprise to people? <laughs> those are good questions. And oh my gosh, I could go on and on. The answer is yes, yes, yes. Explanation <laughs> always. Right. And so let me just tell you a couple of stories. I want to tell you, um, a, a couple of stories. So I'll, I'll actually tell you three because they're great questions, Mike. And so as owner of Alturas Analytics, you know, in the year 2000 starting, you know, you still have to do marketing. You still have to do sales. And so we were, you know, doing the trade show thing. We were traveling to the Bay Area and I would go in and give our spill and talk to science. And I guess in the, in the year 2000, I'll tell you the story. In the year 2000, um, you know, it was, e- email was, was, was used a lot. There was no really cell phone text messages, real time communications. If you guys remember, you, you might be too young. Don't you don't even have to answer that. Okay, I know you're younger <laughs> than me. And so we, we are we're on an airplane to um, 
to the Bay Area. And we had this meeting with a, a pretty possible potential big client. And they sent an email. They found out where we were located. And they sent an email that said, basically, you know what? We didn't know all these details until later, but hey, you know what? You guys don't need to come and visit us. Well, we just totally acted like we didn't get the email and we showed up and knocked on the door anyway. And so, <laughs> and so, and it was a good opportunity to get in front of people. They didn't do business with us, but some of those people that left that company later did business with us later. And it was just, a, you know, you've got to get in front of people. You've mm-hmm. got to be able to tell your story. You've got to be able to market to them and, and tell them and give them kind of your sales pitch. And so once we do, once I, usually I'm pretty good at that. I'm usually pretty good at that. Once I do that, usually you can, it's a pretty high success rate. That's one example. And I, I you know, we do cold calling to, to people in New Jersey and Boston and they'd say, what, where are you located? Are you located in Iowa? Right. Like, right. In, 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 in Indiana? No, I don't know. Okay, so that's by Iowa, right? Well, no, not really. Yeah. So, you, you know, we'd have to say, we're five hours away from Seattle. You know, we're by Seattle. Oh, okay. All right. Now I know where you're at. I mean, seriously, that's where. Mm-hmm. You, you get a lot of people from Boston and New York. They have not left those communities ever. So you couldn't just them tell them, happen. you know, we're just we're just a little bit east of Othello, Washington. <laughs> you know, no, 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 it's never. And you couldn't really tell them Spokane. They'd say, oh, Spokane. Oh, yep. Yeah, Spokane. Spokane. Yeah, Spokane. Yeah, actually, it was good when at least they knew about Gonzaga Bulldogs. So you could talk about that. WSU had a good football team in the early 2000s, so we could talk about that. You know, it was just trying to make these connections. And, mm. and I remember... So we're in Moscow, Idaho. Most of our competitors, yes, are in bigger type cities. There's a few that aren't, okay? And so, um, and, I, and that when I started the company, I picked a few of our competitors, and I wanted to, I modeled ourselves after them. And, and, I, and I also picked some of our competitors that I didn't want to be like, and just to see where success was and where success, where success wasn't. And, and certainly it was a challenge to be in Moscow, Idaho. Now I think it's a blessing, and I think it's better than, in a, a big city because we we give people an opportunity. We, we have a very low turnover. You know, my company has a very low turnover. And so in, in bigger cities, there's more opportunities. And a lot of people, we know this in life, it's human nature. You always think that the grass is greener on the other side. Yeah. Yeah. And so there's a lot of people that go from job to job to job looking for either a little bit more money or, you know, a better work environment or a better boss or whatever. And I'm, I'm not saying... Those things aren't important, by the way, but it just usually does nobody any good. And so it's it's great for us that we have a great team, low turnover. People like to be here. We treat them very well. And but I'm proud to say that that I that I started that. I never thought I would be. It was never a goal of mine to set out to build a company that was a major scientific employer on the Palouse. Hmm. But that's what I've done, and it's really really cool to be in that conversation. And so. Um, uh, so my other story, so you, know, you have to explain to people in New Jersey or Boston where, where Idaho is at. And they'd say, oh, I'd never, never do business with somebody there or whatever. I could, it was probably about 2005, probably. I'm thinking about 2005. And I'm traveling a lot at that point because I was like the, the main salesperson, the main marketing person. I was the one that got out in front of people to give us their skill. Nobody else could. Nobody else could. Nobody else had those skills. And so... Um, I was on this bus being taken back from an exhibit hall from one of the major conferences. We call it AAPS. And it was late at night, so the bus was almost empty. It's me and this one other guy. He's from one of our competitors. And um, in, in, I'll just say the New Jersey area. I don't want to give it away. So I'll just say the New Jersey area. And I walk on the bus. He's the only one on there. And he says, Shane, how is Moscow, Idaho doing? And I'm like, whoa, <laughs> this guy knows where we're at. Hmm. And right then, that was like five years later after I started the company, I'm like, we've arrived. And, you know, hmm. I don't, I say this with all humility, but we put Moscow, Idaho on the map for for my industry, for bioanalysis, for science. Wow. I, I, when, I, when I go travel to England, people know that we're from Idaho. Hmm. And that is, I'm extremely proud of that. Extremely proud of that. And that's nothing that can ever be changed. And so it's real. it's challenging. Yes. And some people still question, well, you know, I think if we were in a bigger city, we might, 
even do better. You know what? Woulda, coulda, shoulda. And we might someday. We might expand to that. You know, I just, I don't know what the future brings. And so, anyway, it's just been a, a blessing, truly a blessing for me. And I'm just very grateful for this area. Yeah, no, that's that's funny because I think you and I first met, I mean, I was probably around that 2005, somewhere in there, <laughs> when you were traveling a lot. And I was uh, working for MZ at the time and traveling a lot. And I think we met on an airplane um, both headed back oh, to the right. same place. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. That's, <laughs> Actually, that was certainly we my, traveling. I had the same experience, you know, I was early in the days of MZ, um, and same thing of, uh, you know, taking that time to having to explain where you're, where you're living and, but, you know, find a lot of times people are, you know, they may look down on you a little bit at first, but most people are jealous, you know, <laughs> it's like, cause, because I, they, I they know the quality of life in that small town, it's, it's such a such an awesome opportunity to be here and um like you said just have have all of that and still be you know with all the perks of a, a land grant two land grant universities and um you know all the well, I, I agree that that with you. Like, yeah i think there is some jealousy there like hey i want that you know like mm-hmm. that's what people are thinking like i wish i didn't have to commute two hours each way a day yeah i i, I agree with you and so i'm i'm just so so grateful to be in this community and the Palouse is just, I'm glad to call it home. And um, Moscow's just been really, really good to us for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we'll probably have to start wrapping it up, but I wanted to know about your podcast um, and, and oh. what you're, you yep. what you're doing there. Um, you mentioned hard work, um, secrets to success. What's your podcast all about? What are you doing with it? And I guess, what are some, what are some messages that you'd like to leave us with in terms of you know, maybe either for the next generation or that kind of thing for how do we, how do we avoid the trap of that entitlement mentality? Well, I think that's even more important right now coming out of what we're looking at as a, probably a pretty big recession. Well, you know what, Catherine, I, let's talk on that. I mean, I'll, I'll finish up probably with that, but so, you know, it's been something that people have been encouraging me to do for a while. And, you know, I, I, I always, um, I, I'll be honest, I can never fit in just one box. I could never be just a scientist. I could never be just an entrepreneur. I could never be just a power lifter or a bodybuilder. I'm so many different things. And I, I, God's given me a gift, and I'm just going to run with it. So I do everything at 110%, and I'm not defined by one thing. And I truly, my, my mission in life is to glorify God, and secondarily is to leave a legacy for my children. And I want to do that. My mission, my vision, my mission, or my purpose, but my mission is to inspire as many people every single day that I can. And so my podcast kind of wraps all that up. So obviously I'm a scientist. I'm involved in the testing industry. So on Monday we talked about COVID-19 testing. Mm. Um, I'm also a faithful guy. I'm a believer of Jesus. And so today we talked about faith during a pandemic with mm. my pastor and my friend who is now used to be pastor at Real Life in Moscow. Now he's pastor in a, in a church in Denver. And so and I'm going to have a constitutional lawyer on my program in the next couple of weeks to talk about our rights during COVID-19 and mm-hmm. how they've been affected. Right. I'm going to have a, a, a business person, um, another scientist, uh, all kinds of people. And so, but and I'm gonna also going to have power lifters, power lifting coaches, um, trainers, bodybuilding coaches, and all these different people that really, they embody the never be outworked mindset. Mm-hmm. They embody the secrets of success. That's what it's called. The podcast is called Secrets of Success. And the, 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 really the theme is never be outworked. And all the people that I've had on and all the people that I'm going to have on, just there was always something that I had this connection with them. Like then you hear their stories and it's like, oh my gosh, they truly are just always working. And, and, I, I, it, and I don't mean by working like being busy. I mean that they have a mindset that they can do anything they put their mind to. And that's incredible. That's what the podcast is about. So there's really, it's not just about science. It's not just about bodybuilding. It's not just about um, God or politics or any of that. It's about all these people that have this mindset of never being outworked. And so proud to be surrounded by them. And Catherine, you mentioned this. Mm -hmm. This never be outworked mindset is more important than ever. I don't care how many letters I have behind my name. I don't care my, my background, my experience, my expertise what job I have now or what job anybody has now. But there's an entitlement mentality right now. And the ones that have survived this recession, and we talked about this on the podcast today, there's lots of uncertainty. And that's what, that's why people need to have faith and a call to action. It's like the ones that know how to work 
and the ones that have that mindset that they can take care of themselves and they're not entitled to get taken care of by somebody else, they're the ones that are going to survive. And do I think that that's necessarily a good thing? I don't know. It is what it is, and it will separate the cream from the milk, so to speak. And that happens once in a while, and good things become of that. And so it, it's very important in this, in, right in these times that we're talking about to have that mindset of never being outworking. So stay tuned for a lot of other people on my, on my show, and it's been going so well. And we do it live. Facebook, um, on my Facebook stream usually, and, I, and then I'm going to download it to my YouTube channel. I also have a website, drsdedham.com, and uh, follow me on Facebook, and that's or, or Instagram, or LinkedIn, or Twitter, but <laughs> I, I Facebook, I Facebook all, all my podcasts live, I live awesome. Facebook them, and so, and they're on my, they're on my archives, so Shane Dedham, look me up on Facebook, and, and you'll find me there, and so, I, that's what it's about, never being at work, and I just appreciate the time you guys have given me. I'm so grateful for it. And um, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank yeah, you. Thanks, Shane. We really appreciate yeah, that. Absolutely. If I can ask one final question, Shane, absolutely. as we wrap it yeah. up in line with what you were mentioning about, you know, mentorship and obviously you've been a coach. So since we're looking at that entitlement mentality, what's the one big pushback you feel like for kids to fight against that? Or if it's parents to raise up your kids and the example that you're giving them, how do you push back? Okay, explain that to me, Catherine. What do you mean by how do you push back? How do you push back against that entitlement mentality? So if you're raising up your kids, which we're talking about the next generation, right, to not be entitled, to be the hard workers, what's the number one thing to do? Uh, Okay, I I wish I could say number one thing. I can't. I can probably say say three things, okay? Responsibility, accountability, and boundaries. Okay? And that's it. I'd love to be on another podcast. I'd talk about that, but... I can tell you this, my putting boundaries around your children to know it's okay if they are upset with you, you are not their friend. You are not their friend. You're doing them damage by doing only friendly things to them. If you do not make your child accountable and responsible with consequences of day-to-day living, then they will be entitled. And I can honestly say in the last year, especially my two youngest kids, have become accountable and responsible because of responsibilities that I've given in and boundaries I put on my relationship. And you know what? Sometimes they're upset with me, but you know what? They have become different kids because of it. And I used to worry about what my kids would think about me. Do I always hope that my kids love me? Yes. I will always love them. Always. But if you don't put those appropriate boundaries in place with your children, then they will be entitled people in the world and that is bound to have all kinds of problems and so i don't know if that explains it but responsibility accountability and boundaries oh, and that's a good those answer. Are, yeah and those i i can't stress it enough that when i started saying and doing things to my kids and i want you to know this in a loving way by the way but setting firm loving boundaries and they did not like it do you know how hard that was for me I would talk to my dad so much about that. And they're like, Shane, he'd like, Shane, stick to your guns. Stick to your guns. It's, it's going to come out better. It's going to come out better. And after about six months of my kids getting upset with little things I would do, like, hey, you didn't do the dishes, so you don't get your full allowance this week. But your brother did extra, so he's going to get your allowance. Doing things like that, you did upset them? Yes, it did. But boy, they are different people now. And I'm so proud of that. Mm-hmm. So proud of them. So... That's, that's, that's advice that I can give. It's worked well for me. And so it's been a really, really joyful, grateful ride for me. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Shane. Really appreciate it. And we will uh, link to your website and, and, uh, and send people your way through uh, in the show notes and everything. And thanks again, keep up the great work and, uh, well, uh, yeah, one of these days, once all this craziness is lifted, we'll have to have you on in person and and talk (laughs) some more. I would love that. I would love that. Hey, thanks. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Catherine. You guys keep up the good work too. And, uh, um, God bless. Thanks, Shane. Bye. All right. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for joining us. Like, share, subscribe. We'll see you next week.